What's up designers and welcome back to Remton Games. What you just saw was an artificial intelligence that I built at the end of 2018 to play Pokemon Emerald. Today, I want to share with you all how I designed and built this AI, some of the principles behind it, and even some ways that it could be improved. Before we jump into those details, however, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you watching this. Although this channel is still small, it's been growing thanks to all of you sharing, liking, and commenting on these videos, and that really means a lot to me. I also really appreciate the kind words and even the critiques that you all leave in the comments. With that out of the way, let's get started. Before I go over the details of how I programmed this agent, we should briefly go over some of the background on AI. For most people, when you hear the term AI, your mind probably goes to something like HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, or perhaps GLaDOS from the Portal series, machines that can think and learn like a human being. Those types of machines are what is known as general AI, or strong AI, and developing machines or programs like that is still a long ways off. Instead, in modern computer science, we use various types of weak AI that are very good at doing a specific task, but generally can only do that task. Among weak AI, there are a huge variety of different techniques that can be used, from following a predetermined series of steps that may not even be considered intelligent, to advanced machine learning techniques that are used for something like Amazon's Alexa. While all of these different techniques work wildly differently, they all require three things. First, they need some way to collect data, either through digital messages or sensors such as cameras, microphones, etc. Second, they require some way to process this data and come to a decision about what they should do next, and finally, they need some way to execute this decision, whether that be moving a robotic arm or sending a verbal response through a speaker. These are the same three things that we need to build our Pokemon AI. We need some way for it to read data from the game, process that data, and then send instructions back into the game. To accomplish this, I used a program called OpenAI Gym Retro. This was developed by OpenAI, an artificial intelligence research organization, for the purpose of researching artificial intelligence using retro video games. This program is actually intended to be used for something called reinforcement learning, which is an AI technique that allows an agent to slowly learn a task over time by rewarding it when it does well at the task and punishing it when it does poorly. However, my approach for this project was a bit different and I mostly used Jim Retro as a platform for interacting with the game. The way Jim Retro works, you need three things. First, you need a ROM of the original game. A ROM is basically a digital copy of the game that's created by copying all of the data off of the original cartridge. This makes the ROM basically identical to the original game, but allows you to play it on a different device. In this case, my computer instead of a Game Boy Advance. In order to actually run the ROM, you need an emulator, which basically digitally mimics the hardware of the original console in the same way that the ROM mimics the software. Finally, you need the OpenAI Retro software itself. This software basically works as a wrapper around the emulator that allows you to read the memory at specific locations and manipulate that data using Python script. Jim Retro allows us to get the three things we need to program our AI. First, we have a data.json file that allows us to read data from the game's memory. Each piece of data that we're reading has a name, a memory location that tells us where to read from, and a data type that tells us how to interpret that data. As you can see from this file, this allows us to collect information such as the stats of each Pokemon on our team, or the X and Y position of our character. Next, we have another file, in this case called emerald.py. This file is the one that actually determines how our AI is going to perform, and honestly it's a bit of a mess, but I was doing the best I could at the time. Because this is where the majority of the action takes place, there's a lot going on, and I'll dig more into the details of what's actually happening in this file a little bit later. The final component we need is a file called scenario.json. 
This file represents the various actions that our AI can take. In this case, those actions correlate to various buttons from the Game Boy Advance, and when the AI sends that message to the emulator, it interprets it as if that button was pressed. Now that we know what tools and files we need, let's take a look at how we actually write those files. First, let's take a look at the data.json file, which we use to keep track of various pieces of information in the game. However, first, we actually need to locate that information. I'll be the first to admit that I'm not much of a data miner. In fact, this project is really the only time I've done anything of the sort, which made this next part pretty difficult. However, I will show you the method that I used, which was enough to get me by for the most part. The way I located the data I needed was by using a part of Jim Retro called the Integration UI. This program basically lets you play through the game manually while keeping track of various memory locations. To find the specific data points you want to keep track of, you first need to know the value in that location. For example, suppose I wanted to locate my Mudkip's health value. I could make a new search in the integration UI and call it Mudkip Health. For value, I know that its current value is 27, so I'll search for that. That brings up a whole bunch of different memory values, each of which had a value of 27 at the moment that I searched. I need to narrow it down, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into battle and actually let my health drop. Now I can do another search, this time with the new health value. The difference is, this time it's only searching through the memory locations that it identified last time. This is going to really narrow it down. Now we only have a handful of different possible locations. Keep in mind that many of these memory locations are actually the same address. This is because each address can be interpreted in several different ways that represent different data types. We just need to choose the data type that matches what we're looking for. In this case, an unsigned little endian integer. Locating the data this way can be very time consuming, but luckily I didn't have to find every single value by hand. For example, you can speed up this process by using a resource like Bulbapedia, which has information on the different data structures that were used in the Generation 3 Pokemon games. Using this information, I know that once I've located the HP value of my Pokemon, their attack value is only 4 bytes after that. I also know that the HP value of my next Pokemon will be 100 bytes later, and so forth. By using these data structures, I only need to search for a few key values to find most of the information that I need. Once I've found all the values I'm looking for, I can not only use them for my artificial intelligence, but I can also do fun stuff in the emulator like make all of my Mudkip stats 999. Now that we've located the data our AI needs, let's take a look at how we actually program the agent itself. The way I see it, Pokemon is basically split into two parts navigating the overworld, and battling. Each of these tasks is very different, so I use two different techniques to handle these different scenarios. First, let's look at the task of navigating the overworld in Pokemon. A big part of playing Pokemon is navigating from town to town, and our agent had to be able to navigate somehow. This means it had to have some idea of where it was, where it wanted to go, and also be able to deal with complications such as cutscenes, dialogue boxes, and walking in and out of buildings. I know that somewhere in the game's memory is information about each area map and how they're connected, and if I could access this information, then my agent would be able to navigate much more intelligently. Unfortunately, I am still a novice data miner, and the techniques that I've been using require me to know the value of the memory location I'm looking for. Because of this, I had to find a different approach. Luckily, I was able to locate memory values that keep track of the player's X and Y locations by using the assumption that their initial position at the beginning of the game would be considered 0-0. Zero, zero. While this information wasn't much to go off of, I was able to develop a navigation system with two main parts, mapping and pathfinding. Because I'm unable to access the game's internal map data, I decided to have my character create their own maps. Every time the AI moves, or attempts to move, they learn a little bit more about the world. If they're able to walk to that new square, they mark that space as walkable. 
If they aren't, they mark that space as an obstacle, and if stepping on that square takes them to a whole new location, such as entering a door into a building, then they mark that space as a warp. Each time they move to a new square, the AI updates their maps to reflect the new information, and this map can be used for pathfinding. Pathfinding is the second component of the navigation system. The AI doesn't really have any idea of where it's supposed to go, so it makes up for this by attempting to go everywhere. It basically has two goals. First, if there are any spaces that it can reach that are still unknown, then it'll try to navigate to the closest of those spaces. If there aren't any unknown spaces that it can reach, then it'll backtrack and try to visit the space that it visited least recently. Using this method, it should eventually reach every space. Once the agent has selected a destination, it uses a pathfinding algorithm known as A star to actually find a path and navigate to that destination. While I'm not going to go into all the details of A star search here, I'll link down below to a computer file video that I'm sure does a great job of explaining it, the really brief explanation is that it builds the path one square at a time by determining which square is going to bring us closest to our end destination using an estimate of the remaining distance. This algorithm is a very common one for navigation as it's guaranteed to give an optimal path and is also very time efficient. Putting all these pieces together and our agent is able to move around the world by picking a destination, pathfinding to that destination, and then building a map of the world around them as they go. However, moving around the world is only half of what we need it to do. As this is a Pokemon AI, we of course also want it to be able to battle. I'm gonna be upfront and confess that when I was working on this, I wasn't really able to implement the battle system that I had dreamed of. This is because, due to time constraints and my limited experience with data mining, I wasn't able to locate certain pieces of information in the memory that were necessary to implement my design. With that information, I would have been able to build the system I'm about to describe, but keep in mind that from here, the discussion is more hypothetical. This is how I would build the battle system, but it hasn't yet actually been built. My concept would basically use a game tree to determine the most effective action each turn. A game tree basically looks at every possible action that you can take in a turn, from each attack, to switching Pokemon, to possibly even actions such as using an item or running away, and assigns a score to those actions. In this instance, for example, the score would take into account how much damage you can do to your opponent. Higher damage is better, with a bonus for knocking out one of their Pokemon. However, it would also assign negative points for the damage that your opponent can do to you, and give a big penalty for your own Pokemon fainting. In order to determine these scores, you need to know things such as your Pokemon and your opponent's Pokemon's types, as well as the types of moves that you have available for things such as resistances or super effective attacks, as well as calculating same type attack bonus. You would also need to know your Pokemon's stats, as well as the attack values and accuracy of each move in order to calculate how much damage the move would do. It can use this information to calculate how much damage your attack will do to your opponent on average, and it can do the same for your opponent to see how much damage your Pokemon will take. It could then look several moves ahead to find the course of action that's likely to result in the most damage to your opponent while resulting in the least damage to your own Pokemon. This might include choosing the most effective attack for your Pokemon, or switching to another Pokemon that has a more advantageous type matchup. There is a lot more I could talk about with this system, but I think that covers most of the important bases. I'm sure many of you still have a lot of questions, however, and I will try to answer those questions in the comments down below. If enough of you have questions or want to hear more, then maybe I'll eventually make a follow-up video answering and responding to some of those questions, so please let me know if you want to hear more. I also have a number of other projects I've worked on over the years, so let me know if you found this interesting and maybe we can talk about those some other time. That's all I have for today. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video. 
If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss more videos like this in the future. If you want to see more, check out my other videos, like my previous one where I look at some of the tricky and controversial economic issues surrounding the price of games and the game industry. And join me next time for another installment of my Game Designer Spotlight series, this time focusing on Richard Garfield. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.